The Local Youth Worker is a podcast brought to you by Reformed Youth Ministries. Since 1972, RYM has sought to reach and equip youth for Christ. And this podcast seeks to reach and equip those parents and youth workers who share that same desire. For more information on our student conferences, youth leader training, or resources, visit rym.org. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Local Youth Worker, a podcast brought to you by Reformed Youth Ministries. I'm your host, John Pirrett. Uh, This is episode 382, and I'm here with Lynn Howard. Lynn, how's it going? Good. How are you, John? Doing well. It's good to see you. Thanks. It's also very fun to hear my new last name. It was- I know. <laughs> well, it, it, as I was saying it, I'm like, I hope I'm not getting this wrong. <laughs> yeah, <sounds great. laughs> um, yeah. So, so yeah, Lynn um, Howard now recently married. Um, as you'll hear in the interview in just a little bit, four months. Is that what you said? Yes, four months. All right. And uh, Lynn and I will be talking to Rebecca McLaughlin. And um, as you'll maybe here and in the interview, I'm not exactly sure how it comes out. Uh, my internet was messing up uh, left and right. And so I was dropping out of the interview, but thankfully Lynn was there uh, to pick up the baton and, and, and carry that on. So, so glad you were a part of it. <laughs> Me too. We just girl chatted the whole time. It's fine. <laughs> Great. Looking forward to hearing it. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's, it's kind of bizarre to me that it's an interview that actually I haven't gotten to hear a whole lot of. So uh, looking forward to that. And, and as you'll hear in the interview as well, um, we've had several different time zones we were working with and Lynn is uh, recording this in California, kind of on a vacation. And so that's just awesome that you took the time to, to do that. Um, Scott and Tree will also be joining us in the middle segment talking about insecurities of life and ministry. Um, and we also got to talk to Rebecca uh, about insecurities as well, and that will be uh, forthcoming. Um, Lynn, uh, registration for RYM's youth leader training has has opened. Um, I know I first met you at, at one of RYM's YLTs. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts about uh, YLT and just encouraging people to be a part of it. I think youth leader training YLT is a uh part of the reason I was able to stay in ministry as long as I have been because it's such a it's such a refreshing experience for my spirit and for yeah like my mind and it's there's something so special when you can get with people and you tell them like oh this parent and they're like no I totally get it you know you don't have to explain to somebody and you know they do get it and they also have a parent who's like that or a student who's like that or it's I mean, honestly, in the past couple of years, it's been, my church is going through this sort of thing. And then to hear other people say, yeah, mine too. So it doesn't feel like, well, if I went anywhere else, like their churches aren't having a hard time with this, you know, like every other place is perfect. It's my church. That's a dumpster fire or whatever it is, or um, it's, and it's not like that. So just to be really like encouraged by the spirit, by friends Mm -hmm. who are doing the same thing that you're doing or similarly in a different place. And then also to be encouraged that people are doing the same thing in other places. You know, the gospel doesn't ride or die with our Sunday youth groups or our Wednesday youth groups, things like that. And then just all of the training that we get, like Nancy Guthrie and, oh my gosh, um, Scott and all these other wonderful people. Um, It's so great to be resourced well um, and, and leave thinking, okay, not only have I been built up, but now my ministry can move forward or grow because of the things that I've learned at YLT. So I highly recommend it. And then of course, always a week in Nashville or in Pennsylvania, wherever you are mm. is always so wonderful <laughs> with, yeah. with some friends you didn't even know you had. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Just yeah, echoing everything you, you just said, I mean, it's awesome to be able to connect with people who are going through the same joys and struggles of, of youth ministry. And then, yeah, some of the, the lineup this year, which I know I'm kind of going from memory, so I'm going to miss some of this, but I know Nancy Guthrie will be back with us. Ke- Kelly Capic will be there. Um, Sam Alberry, um, others. Um, so ex- excited about the, the training that'll take place as well as just the fellowship and the worship and then preaching at, at night that we get to sit under. It's so rich. And so just encouraging everyone go to rym.org slash YLT and you can find more information about that, um, either the Nashville or the Pennsylvania area. Um, but uh, Lynn, looking forward to, to getting to our uh, interview with Rebecca. Uh, for now, here is uh, Tree and Scott.
All right, I'm here once again with Scott and Tree. We've been talking about insecurities over the last couple of weeks. We're finishing it up today to talk about helpful ways to deal with our insecurities. Um, Tree, you said you've got a question for us? Yeah, I almost brought this up the last time we were on. Uh, I was just trying to think through the, something we talked about last week with you know just the whole idea of people-pleasing and uh, being all things to all people. Uh, so how do we find a balance in that? Because I think the temptation really is to as you're trying to be all things to all people, as you're trying to minister to the, the various levels of people that we interact with, the temptation is to try and please everybody, uh, which we've already talked about how that can be an insecurity. So it just feeds into that cycle again. So how do we find that balance apart from finding our identity in Jesus, which we know is the right answer? <laughs> how do we practically uh, put safeguards up so we don't do that? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll jump in and just say, for me, um, it has simply been just failure um, and realizing that I just completely uh, was finding my identity and doing all the things you said we shouldn't do, um, trying to please everybody, trying to make everybody happy, and then the Lord in His grace reminding me um, that, okay, I'm, I'm falling into the same old sins and same old patterns. Um, so to me, it's not necessarily, you know, <clears throat> it hasn't been getting it right and having this secure identity in Christ. It's more of after the fact, realizing, okay, John, this is what you were doing, and this is where you were looking for your security, but now let's, you know, correct that. So it's more of just, I guess, repentance later, um, coming back to the Lord, realizing that He loves me, that He accepts me, that um, I, He loves to welcome repentant sinners, and so... Um, yeah, it's something that, yeah, I continue to fail out and have not uh, figured out any safeguards or anything like that necessarily. Um, I don't know. I can try to think of some scenarios and think if there's been some growth in some areas, but um, no, but more failures, I guess. I don't know if that does that make sense. What I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Would I mean in that passage when it talks about being all things, all people? It's, I mean, Paul wrote that, right? Mm-hmm. I should know my Bible better. Um, but you're getting it, old. He's talking about, we established talking about that taking on, <laughs> but he's talking about taking on cultural uh, preferences that are not against biblical principles, right? Is that kind of what he's? I believe so. Yeah. Before I reference that passage, we probably should have gone back and like read some commentaries. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it seems like the whole goal of, of that is to is for the advancement of the gospel and not to please men. Um, so it's like the, the aim of it is different. You know, if it's out of insecurity, the, the aim is going to be to get people's approval. And if it's, if it's being all things to all people in a way that honors God, it's going to be, the goal is going to be, um, I'm going to take on this thing, this, this cultural trend or whatever it is that that might advance the gospel um you know i don't know what that would be i don't know a specific example um because i'm not going to dress like a teenager to for the advancement of the gospel but i am going to try to not dress like a dork or you know whatever that <laughs> that might hinder them them hearing the gospel um do they use the word dork anymore you just all the time yeah it's a <laughs> big word in oxford yeah. um tree do you have any thoughts on on safeguards turning your question back on you or are you eating something <laughs> I, <thought> him. <laughs> I, was, I was trying choking. <laughs> i was trying to finish that mint before you asked me that question <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's okay uh yeah i think you know the you mentioned placing our identity in Christ and that's gotta be the found the, the foundation of it. I've, I've grown to get to a point and it's not like this always, but you know, especially when you preach, like it, it's a pretty vulnerable thing. Like you put yourself out there and like a lot of preachers for those that are listening or, or anybody that, that teaches, like there's a, a bit of a, a low that comes right after teaching or a sermon like where you're just like i don't know if anybody was tracking with me or i don't know if anybody 
was paying attention. I have, uh, you know, it's, it's funny that there's two people in my congregation that are head nodders. And I, I, t- <laughs> I find myself like, Oh, wait, like whenever I'm like, I don't know if anybody's listening right now, I always look for them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and once I see, okay, I'm, I'm all right. Uh, um, but th- there's this point where like right afterwards, you kind of go into this little low and I, I've, again, I'm not perfect at it, but I've, I've gotten to a point where I've, I'm dealing with that a lot better. And it's because um, I'm trying to pull up Jeremiah 17, seven through eight, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its, its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes for its leaves remain green. And it's not anxious in the year of drought for it does not seize. And I don't have the rest of the verse there does not cease to bear fruit. Um, I think, if, if we get to the, the end of either an event or teaching or a one-on-one or, or a conversation with a parent and our temptation is to like walk away from that thinking, I don't know if, if I'm welcome or I don't know if anybody likes me or I don't know if that lesson was good at all. If we don't put our trust in God and if we don't look to him for that identity, that's always going to happen. Right. And we have to, we have to be like that tree planted by water or else we're going to wither up. We're going to shrink up. We're going to, we're going to die off. Uh, that's why I love that imagery. It's, it's from, from Psalm one as well. Uh, you know, we, if we plant ourselves by a stream, we're going to have life. That's where we're going to find our joy. That's where we're going to find our security. But if, if we just find ourselves just kind of throwing a lesson out there and, and not like trying to, to preach it to ourselves, I think that that can lead to some insecurity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I think too, like, I'm just thinking of, you know, helpful ways that, that I've tried to, to deal with insecurities, um, is taking days off or vacation or rest, however you want to, um, kind of classify that because it is, you know, we're we're talking about identity here and so much of our identity comes from our profession. So, you know, our job, what we do for a living. And it's, it's just been so helpful for me to just remove myself from that thing (laughs) and just get my mind away from it. And, um, oftentimes, you know, that happens on a day off. Oftentimes it's more of, you know, an extended vacation when you can kind of usually, I don't know, for me, it's like, oftentimes my mind is still churning on that first day of vacation, but then it's like, okay, you got two days and then it's just kind of like you unplug from it. And so you just, I don't know, to me, it's just clarifying. It's reminded me, you know, this job at the end of the day, even though, you know, it's ministry for me, um, isn't where my identity lies. And, you know, I'm reminded of being a husband, being a father to my children and just not caring, um, about all of those things. And so, so much of those insecurities do just kind of fade away when I'm able to unplug, um, take a day off, go on vacation, or even, I mean, kind of related to this too, is this hobbies, you know, um, doing other work that's not your vocation. Um, yeah, to, to me, it's just, I don't know, it, it kind of realigns my thinking and, um, yeah, it just provides perspective and clarity for me. So I don't know what you guys think about, about that, if that's been helpful for you guys. Yeah, I think I heard somebody say that taking a Sabbath is you're resting in God's rule. You know, he, he's on his throne, he's ruling. And so you can not work while God is at, and trust that he is still at work. Um, so I think that's a great way to kind of um, address some of those insecurities. Um, I think for, for me, one of the things that I struggle with uh, is, you know, I've got a bunch of elders that uh, I, I want to, you know, make happy. Um, I've got, you know, pastoral staff I want to make happy. I got parents I want to make happy. I got students I want to make happy. And so I want, I want all of them to think that I'm doing a good job. But for me, it's, it's good to remember that, you know, the Lord is ultimately who I'm working for. And, you know, there's Colossians 3, 23 says something like in, in, in your work, do it as unto the Lord. Um, and it's talking to, it's talking to slaves, but I think that applies to us to just that, that the Lord is our boss and, you know, we've got to, give an account to him one day of, of our work. And so, you know, if I'm not out every night, 
at games or whatever like that, you know, which I might feel like somebody else expects me to do. I can think, okay, is the Lord good with me not going to all these things? Yeah. I think he would want me to spend time with my family and just remembering it kind of reframes. Okay. The Lord is going to approve of my work or like I'm, I'm seeking his approval in my work, not anybody else's. And that kind of helps me reframe uh, some of those insecurities and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tree, it looks like you're about to say something. I think talking about them also helps. I think our temptation is to turn inward with our insecurities and try to deal with them ourselves because we don't want other people to know about them. And that in itself is self-defeating because we tend to go to a place of shame and Satan loves when we're in a place of shame and wants to keep us there as long as possible. So even just finding some a few people to kind of just talk through like the things that we fear and the things that we're insecure about, I think is so helpful. Uh, we've got uh, a, a pastor's meeting on Wednesdays. Uh, so it's me and, and our senior pastor and our REF and REF international pastor all get together Wednesday mornings just to kind of unpack, like, how, how are we? Like, what's, what's going on? Like, what, what are things that we're fearful of in ministry? What are, what are things that we need help with and prayer for? And it usually turns into this like really sweet time of just praying for one another and uh, just trying to encourage one another um, and just bouncing ideas off each other too, if we're really struggling with how to do something. So I think talking about it is, is a great first step. Uh, And I, I agree with what you said earlier about like taking some time to kind of get away from them as well. I think we need a combination of both because uh, we're not trying to run from them, right? We just kind of need to take our mind off them for a little bit. Um, but he, even after that, taking some time to, to talk through it with somebody. Uh, yeah. yeah, I could not agree more. I mean, just the importance of community in this, um, being able to share that with others. Um, and I guess that, that kind of gets to the, the C.S. Lewis, you know, you two um, phrase, just talking about, oh, I thought I was the only one. Um, so yeah, there, there's just something so reassuring about that, and comforting. Um, and also too, just want to throw out, and I know this sounds like something we're supposed to say, but uh, God's word and prayer <laughs> has been um, life-giving uh, to me. I mean, it's, you know, I know, um, it seemed like it was my Hebrew professor who said, you know, God's word would not make sense apart from pain. And um, so much of, you know, our insecurities, are, they're painful, they're miserable, um, they're awful. And it just makes God's word um, come alive in so many ways uh, that you just open up his word and you, you feed upon it and uh, commune with him in prayer. And, um, uh, you know, I know that can, again, sound overly pious or that's just, you know, the Sunday school answer we're supposed to give. But um, really, I mean, affliction and pain do uh, make the scriptures resonate so much more on a, on a deeper level. And so, yeah, feeding upon God's word, uh, talking to him in prayer. Uh, casting our cares, our anxieties upon him, as his word tells us to do. So that would definitely be up there for me. Yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, you can't overstate that, that, you know, reading the word, that's going to be where you're reminded of of God's approval of you through Christ, that he He rejoices over you with singing. And, you know, even if it feels like nobody else is, he, he loves you and um, that's where you're reminded of that. That's where you're given kind of a kingdom mindset of what's important, what's not when you maybe feel, uh, unimpressive or whatever to your friends, um, you know, having a kingdom mindset, that's where you're going to be reminded that God is the one who works and, uh, he works through us, but it's also, you know, like Paul said, he planted Apollos watered, but it's God that gave the growth, you know? just those promises that, um, yeah. So being in the word definitely is going to root out some insecurities and, and put your security in the Lord. Mm-hmm. That reminds just, us, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Uh, good. that, that reminds us who our audience is too. I mean, obviously we work with people and we, in a sense, work for people. Uh, but if we're pleasing the Lord, if we're doing, doing the Lord's work, we can find confidence in that. Um, and if, if we're looking to ourselves for that that confidence, then it's never going to happen. But but God's word continually uh, emphasizes that for us. Mm-hmm. 
and it just reminds us, you know, proper perspective. And I was thinking of, you know, Ed Welch's book, when people are big and God is small, um, that so often when we're, you know, fearful and our insecurities are just, you know, raging, um, it's because we've lost perspective of how big God is and we're looking at all of these other things um, and we're, you know, worshiping them as false gods. And so, yeah, getting in the word reminds us how big God is, how glorious he is, how small we are, how small other people are. Um, so, yeah, it just helps our perspective. Um, look, I know we're wrapping this up. Any last words, last thoughts before we close this out, Scott or Tree? So I have a, I have a, beer stein that um has a great quote on it and uh i think it really does kind of get it at some of our insecurities in ministry but it's a it's a quote from martin luther and uh he said that that all he did was preach and preach the word and pray and then while he sat and drank beer with philip and amsdorf two of his buddies that god dealt the papacy a mighty blow and so he was like all i did was preach the word and pray and and while I sat and did nothing, the Lord did all this work. And I think, you know, just that helps me remind myself that, okay, this ministry success, these students' spiritual lives is not on me. I can, I, I can do what I'm called to do, preach the word, pray for these students. But ultimately, it's on the Lord, and he's going to do what he's going to do. And um that's always really reassuring and uh, kind of calms my insecurities on Wednesday nights after I've, uh, after I've just, you know, preached something that I felt like nobody was connecting with and my insecurities are coming in. And, um, you know, it's just encouragement that, that the Lord is at work and he's going to, he can use broken people like me to do his work. Yeah. That's a, that's a good word to, to end on. Uh, Scott, Tree, appreciate you uh, both joining me over the last couple of weeks to, to talk about insecurities. I know others will be helped by this uh, right now. Here's Rebecca McLaughlin. Rebecca, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's good to see you again. I know last time we had you on, um, 10 questions every teen should ask and answer about Christianity was just being released. And since then, I think you've published about 37 other books. Um, <laughs> not, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it. You, you've been publishing a lot. You've been a part of uh, the Gospel Coalition's video series entitled uh, Good Faith Debates, and you're speaking at, at conferences. Um, it seems to me, I mean, your life might be a little bit of a whirlwind. Is it, does it feel that way to you? It does. Uh, I, I do keep a lot of time for local community. So that's nice. It does. It, life feels like a whirlwind, but not one that's fully consumed with things that are about people who don't live within arms reach of me here. So I feel, I don't feel out of balance. Thankfully. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and referencing the, the TGC debates, I'm, I'm just curious it, when I saw those and obviously so much of what the gospel coalition does is, is so professional, but it looks like a movie set. And I mean, you've got <laughs> cameras, you've got, you know, all the, this lighting just kind of behind the scenes. How, how did that feel for you? Have you ever been a part of, of something like that? Uh, just out of know, curiosity. I strongly prefer speaking to an actual audience. Hmm. And the funny thing with the good faith debates was that there was a live audience of sorts. Like there was a, a lecture room with some people in it, but I was instructed not to look at those people and speak to those people, but instead to look at a screen that had colors on it and speak <laughs> as if to the screen. So that was different. But I felt like with that event, almost more than with others, actually, I prayed really hard in advance of it. It was a, a very weighty questions around. Mm. Um, I think the the question was, what was the question? It was about woke, it, woke, it was, woke church. Oh uh, uh, yes, woke church. Is woke church a stepping stone to theological compromise? And that question and that word woke pulls together various things which I passionately believe need to be disentangled from each other. Hmm. In particular, it tends to lump together racial justice and diversity of, of um, racial and ethnic background on the one hand with um, 
affirming same sex affirming or not affirming same sex sexual relationships and transgender identities and I think these are profoundly different things um, in and of themselves and I think the bible points us in completely different directions when it comes to those two very different kinds of thing which get lumped together under the banner of diversity and get lumped together under the the banner of sort of woke or non-woke often in, in in people's minds so I felt the weight of those questions and I prayed really hard and then just sort of got up there and said what I mean, I, I prepared, it wasn't I hadn't prepared, but it felt mm-hmm. more than usual. I always speak without notes, but it felt more than usually like I was just needing to stand there and say what the Lord was giving me to say, mm-hmm. which as someone, I mean, I'm like, a, I'm an Anglican at a Southern Baptist church. So I don't, uh, I, I don't <laughs> often um, even kind of cast things in those terms. And I certainly don't think you know, things that come out of my mouth are necessarily divinely inspired, but it felt on that occasion, like I, I needed to, um, hold myself before the Lord in a particular way and just pray for his help. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, I, I promise we're going to talk about your, your new book, but you just referenced it as well. I, I noticed you did not use notes. And so you said you typically don't use notes when you get up. Is that right? I basically never use notes when I get up because a, a few years ago when I was just starting to, to speak on various things, I was challenged by the example of my, um, my closest Christian friend, he's the closest thing I have to a colleague, although we don't, it's not like we work for the same organization, but um, Rachel Gilson and I both are sort of speaking and writing on, on intersecting questions. And she, when I first met her, was terrified of public speaking to the extent that she would avoid every opportunity that was sort of put in front of her. She works for, for Crew Campus Ministry and so you know, she would find skillful ways to avoid speaking at large group meetings of various sorts. But when I met her, I thought, gosh, not only are you, not only do you have an incredible testimony of coming to, to Christ when you were an undergrad at Yale after your girlfriend broke up with you, um, not only are you fiercely intelligent and deeply in the scriptures um, in a way that humbles me, quite frankly, by comparison, you're a I, I know that you're going to be a really great writer, but I also suspected that she'd be a really good speaker. And when I first saw her speak to a large audience, it's actually a video of it, I thought, wow, yeah, you're exactly, you're, you're where I thought you might be in five years time. Mm-hmm. And she got up in front of a thousand people at a crew winter conference and spoke completely without notes in the most compelling way. And I thought, oh gosh, I've been, I, I tend to you know, write up a manuscript and then I internalize it to where I can be free of my notes for a lot of the time, but it's still, they're still there, like a safety net or a comfort blanket. And so I was thinking, should I do that? I don't want to. It sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went and spoke at a conference in the UK. And because I got the time that I was speaking wrong by an hour, <laughs> <laughs> I ended up having to literally run to the event and didn't have time to grab my notes from the hotel room. Wow. And I had to stand up on a stage in front of about a thousand people and, and give a 40 minute talk on science and faith. And what I realized in that process was that the things that I forgot were the things that were forgettable. Hmm. And that there is a certain kind of connection you could have with a, an audience when you aren't standing behind a lectern with notes or an iPad or whatever because they know you're taking a risk with them and so they're actually more likely to listen to what you're saying because they like you are thinking gosh is she going to forget what's next <laughs> is she is she just sort of making it up as she goes along? I mean usually I, usually I'm not I've, I've planned what I was going to say sometimes I forget and I just have to you know improvise other times um most recently at a TGC event I, I'd worked really hard on my talk I, I had a very specific time frame I was meant to speak in because they were live streaming it and you know it was very clearly timed I think I had like 35 minutes or something and I got to point four on my outline uh, or my um, in my sort of mental script and I knew in my notes point four was actually shorter than the other points and I looked down at the clock and I had 12 minutes to go and I thought all right, point four, which was hope springs eternal. That's going to have to be longer than I'd planned. <laughs> so I had to fill 12 minutes with, with um, things to say on that. And so it's, there's, there's a real vulnerability mm-hmm. to speaking with that notes. Um, 
And I think it's, it, it, it would be easy to do it really poorly. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not a fan of just sort of standing up there unprepared and, and giving a kind of half-baked talk on something. But I think if you um, prepare well and then force yourself to take the risk of setting aside your safety blanket, it does connect better. Yeah, no, I just, I find it fascinating. Um, yeah, I know that that's not why you came on the podcast, but I was just, yeah, again, fascinated by it and, and wanted to hear your process. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah, we're, we're here to talk about your new book, uh, Confronting Jesus, Nine Encounters with the Hero of the Gospel. Um, and, and I was curious too, uh, as I was looking at this, just looking at the dedication, I know you, you dedicate it to somebody specifically, but then you also say, to, to everyone who does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but would take the time to read this book. Um, I'd love for you just to, to tell us a little bit about your heart behind that dedication. What what moved you to dedicate this book uh, in that way? I wrote Confronting Jesus for non-Christians primarily. Like I wrote both Confronting Christianity and 10 Questions Every Teen Should Ask, the sort of junior version of that. Not because I think that mostly non-Christians will buy those books. Um, I'm under no illusions about that but because I wanted it, them all to be books that you could put into the hands of a, a non-Christian friend. And in particular, Confronting Jesus is intended for people who may have actually read Confronting Christianity, which um, explores the, the main objections people would have to the, to the Christian faith and to even considering Jesus, or have you know had some of those conversations with a friend and are at the point where they are interested in in hearing more about Jesus but maybe not yet ready to open a gospel for themselves and just you know pick up a bible and read and so the the target audience or the person I'm I have in mind as as I'm I'm writing a bit like this is is a non-christian who's curious enough but not convinced and about a year ago uh a year and a half ago I became friends with um uh a woman in our neighborhood who has kids at the same elementary school as me and she's Jewish um, and a very smart woman did her undergrad at Harvard in classics and now as a pediatric anesthesiologist you know incredibly mm. well um, well read at all sorts of fronts and a, a good friend of mine and she has kindly in the, for the last nine months or so read in manuscript form all the books that I've written and given me feedback from her perspective as someone who's not a Christian, wow. um, does believe in God, is also very um, familiar with the sort of more secular mindsets, I guess, of, of folks um, in New England and in other parts of, of the States. And she had kindly read the manuscript of Good Running Jesus twice. She sort of read it once through and then said, I'm going to read it again just so, to make sure I'm giving you the right kind of feedback. So that was incredibly kind of her. And also she's exactly the, the kind of person for whom I was writing this book. So I, I dedicated it to her partly to acknowledge and thank her for that. And partly because, yeah, she's the, the kind of person I, I would love to be reading this book. Wow. Now that's, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's excellent to hear. Um, I, I did want to tell our, our listeners as well that, that Lynn has also joined us. Um, there was some confusion on the, the, the time because of just different time zones and everything. So that's all on me, but Lynn, it's, it's good to have you with us. Um, Lynn, before I, I get you to, to jump in as well, I did have a follow up. Rebecca, I, I was reading Dane Ortland's book recently, Deeper. Um, I don't know if you, you've read that or not, but he says in there that we often have a domesticated view of Jesus. He says a junior varsity decaffeinated one-dimensional Jesus of our own making, thinking that we're looking at the real Jesus. I'm just curious, as you spent you know, time writing an entire book about Jesus and studying him closely, did, did you find this to be true of your own view, kind of what things were maybe nuanced or what, what were you surprised by as you began to, to think about Jesus on a deeper level? Yeah, I actually wrote four books on the Gospels in the course of a year because I wanted to spend a lot of time in the Gospels and thinking about <laughs> Jesus very specifically. I think in this book, it wasn't so much that I learned things that were completely new, but that I was 
reconfronted with the fact that Jesus does not fit into our the kinds of boxes that we often try to put him in. Mm-hmm. And I think that's particularly true when we think about the ethical claims and statements that that Jesus made. Um, it's it's typical in our, our present day culture to, for example, see really caring about sexual ethics um, as being sort of on the other end of the spectrum, politically or ideologically or um, sort of socially, from really caring about justice for the poor. And Jesus doesn't allow us to pull those two things apart. In in fact, I think if you look back over the last 2000 years and if you look around the world today, Christian sexual ethics is one of the, the best things ever to have happened in terms of alleviating poverty. I mean, many, many of the ways in which people today are caught in cycles of poverty are as a result of the ways that um, women have been sexually exploited by men outside of the context of, of marriage, for instance. Um, likewise, Jesus, and we don't always understand this because our racial and cultural and national barriers and boundaries are different from those of first century Jews. So when, when we hear Jesus' story, the Good Samaritan, for example, we don't hear it as a story of love across racial difference. In particular, I mean, in Jesus' first century Jewish context, he's talking about loving people you were raised to hate. Hmm. And because we don't, as I say, have the same sort of racial, cultural, national barriers um, and boundaries, we we culturally and historically weren't raised to hate the same people. Um, it's hard for us to hear the force of something like the parable of the Good Samaritan and to apply it as it should be applied to our own racial and cultural barriers and, and, and history. Um, so again, I think to simplify the, the polarization, you need folks both on the right and on the left have a hard time hearing the whole of what Jesus is saying. Um, I have a question, Rebecca. Uh, Go for it. The, okay, have you found that the more naturally somebody is inclined to like um, intellect or an academic sort of mentality, the harder it is for them to connect with Jesus as a human being, as opposed to, um, or not as opposed to, but like, I've, I've seen this in my experience with students of the ones who are like, oh, I know all of these things about Jesus. Like I know all of these stories, but I haven't had this experience of Jesus. And therefore like, it's hard for me to experience Jesus as a human being. Um, versus, uh, um, yeah, like this guy I've read about in in the Bible or heard about as growing up. Gosh, I would want to say sort of no and yes. Uh, on the one hand, I think it is pretty much a myth that more intellectually minded people should be less interested in Jesus, which I know isn't what you're saying, but I think sometimes is is kind of how people well, I mean, of course, if you're like highly educated and, and have that kind of background and, and those sorts of leanings, you wouldn't be interested in Christianity because Christianity is sort of essentially uh, anti-intellectual. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't think that's true of Christianity. It's certainly not true of the, the people I sort of see around me up here in Cambridge, Mass- Massachusetts, the sort of Athens of America kind of intellectually. Um, I think different personalities will find different um, pieces of discipleship more and less challenging. Um, My my 12 year old right now is obsessed with the Enneagram personality (laughs) test. I don't know if you're familiar with that. She's an Enneagram five, which she keeps telling me that the rarest thing to be is a female Enneagram five. (laughs) Um, And Enneagram fives are very interested in knowing all the things about something. um, I think the term for them is the um, investigator and so you know she wants to know all the things about the enneagram and she also wants to know all the things about you know, whatever she'll be interested in in next that's her her mode and she's it's not that she doesn't have feelings she absolutely does but her mind tends to be the the, the front foot 
and her mm-hmm. feelings as sort of the the second foot as, as she moves. Um, my, my best friend Rachel is also an Enneagram 5 and so similarly it's kind of thinking first, feeling second. And apparently, again according to my 12 year old, Enneagram 5s are some of the kind of least likely to be religious people. They're the sort of natural skeptics in some ways because they they operate that way. And I think there's a, a certain extent to which people who are more kind of cerebral um, may may really love the Bible as a book and sometimes find it harder to engage with Jesus sort of more emotionally. Right. Um, conversely, there'll be there'll be people of different personality types who maybe eager to engage with Jesus at an emotional level, but like less interested in really digging into the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think, you know, all of us, our, our, our strengths and our weaknesses tend to be, you know, the two sides of the same, the same coin. So, you know, the, the Enneagram fives among us may be the most biblically literate people who are, who are most you know, hungry for the scriptures in terms of really knowing and understanding. Um, and, and that's obviously like a profoundly important way to connect with Jesus is, is through his word, but that the more emotional side may feel less like it's the, the front foot for them. Is that at all answering the question you were asking? Yes, no, I think yeah. that's great. I'm, does she also like tell you, mom, you're a this Enneagram, does she tell you that? Oh yeah, I'm an Enneagram too. So right. I'm, um, I, I want to love and be loved. And I'm also very much an extrovert. And, and I was chatting with Miranda, my 12 year old the other day about this, that the, in, my, in my experience, and others, others may think differently, but in my experience, the different personality types are gonna have different pieces of discipleship that come more or less easily to them. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean we're let off the hook. Oh, well, because this is my personality, I don't have to do this thing. But it does mean we'll have areas of natural strength and weakness. So as a, a natural extrovert who wants to serve other people as sort of how I'm wired, I find, going to church, engaging with others, serving, um, that all comes very naturally to me. It requires real discipline for me to sit alone with my Bible and to pray by myself. Like that that sort of piece of discipleship is actually where I have to work to, to make it happen. Right. Conversely, uh, my, my friend Rachel, who's wired more like my daughter, she can spend hours studying the scriptures and praying by herself. And it's actually the, the, the harder thing for her is, is moving out toward others in love and service. And, you know, we need each other to kind of challenge where, where, we're, where we're weak and to, to show each other examples of what it looks like to be strong in those areas. Um, it's not that either personality type is like innately better or worse, but we're going to be better or worse naturally at different pieces of, of discipleship and we need to stretch ourselves in different ways. That's so interesting. I've never thought about the Enneagrams, like kind of, to, I mean, you know, they're not, a, this is your label and this is, you know, fit into this box, but right. thinking, yeah. thinking about like, oh, how can those actually help me see what like spiritual disciplines, it makes more sense that that's actually really tough for me. Cause I'm very similar to that. I think I'm a seven or something, an eight, I'm right. not hundred percent sure, which I think that's <laughs> in my Enneagram is like that. You don't care that you're, <laughs> but, um, is Miranda your oldest? Yes. Has she engaged with you in any of these like because of the books that you've been writing, like Confronting Christianity just recently and the Confronting Jesus, like has she been engaging with you in ways that you didn't expect because of the books that you read or is she still not really interested in um, that yet? Oh, she's 100% interested. It, I write about things that we also talk about in general anyway uh, and that she tends to encounter at school. So for example, my book, The Secular Creed, which is looking at those yard signs that say, you know, this house we believe that Black Lives Matter, love is love, women's rights, human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. That her daily bread at school is engaging on, on a variety of, of questions and issues that get lumped together on those signs. Um, she picked up, this is sort of very funny and, and embarrassing, she picked up Confronting Jesus after it was publishing, I gave her a copy. She went upstairs, read it for a half an hour, came down, she said, mum, you, you spelt Pharaoh wrong. I said, no, I haven't. <laughs> She said, yeah, you have. She showed me. And I was like, no, that, I'm sure that, that must, that's got to be right. Like, why? Because it's a sort of thing that even a word, like Microsoft Word would pick up. And she was like, no, 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 it's wrong. She's correct. Half 
half of the time in confronting Jesus, the word Pharaoh is spelt wrong. <laughs> Um, and it took my 12 year old half an hour to realize this. <laughs> so, uh, note to self, have her read books before I get them published. Um, yes! somehow, somehow typos seem to creep in like between even, I mean, I, there are plenty of typos in what I submit, but I don't think that one would have been there because Microsoft Word would correct it. Somehow in the like typesetting process, after the proofreaders have done their thing, I don't know, things happen. Yes, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's let it be known that Faroa is not correct. I love that. That's that's great. What a humbling moment, right? Uh, <laughs> and that's what your twelve-year-old daughter noticed in that half an hour of reading was yes, indeed. Her mom. <laughs> but so you guys are having like conversations because those are the her age is what a lot of us who listen to this podcast would be interacting with or adolescents mm-hmm. in that age group, you know, and and trying to figure out. Well, how do we, you know, encourage them um, to dive into this and experience Jesus without having a lot of these life moments that they need to, they need to cling to God's mercy mm. and to like the self, you know, like recognizing their sin. A lot of them haven't gotten to that yet, which is where we, I know that my relationship with God and has grown in those moments that I've had to learn on the road. This is when I need God's this or Jesus's this more than I've ever needed it before as opposed to like yeah of course I know God is loving yeah I mean honestly if if your 12 year old um or the 12 year old in your youth group is in a public school they are most likely having to cling on to Jesus hard right now um I mean my daughter came to me the other day um, because to uh, this has been a sort of ongoing saga for the last year. She lost two close friends last year because um, they disagreed on LGBT questions. Um, now, the, now the, the, idea the idea that my daughter, daughter is homophobic is, is laughable. She has multiple friends who identify as all sorts of things, and her her favourite teacher last year was a woman who was married to another woman. Um, but she's also, as a follower of Jesus, um, clear on Christian sexual ethics and um, and that same sex relationships are not. Um, not okay for Christians. And a, a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was even just last week, um, two girls in her year who she doesn't really know came up to her and said, do you believe in gay marriage? Just like out of nowhere, just kind of came to mm-hmm. hound her a bit. And she said to me, um, mom, I just, I would really prefer if not, if everyone in the year wasn't bullying me. Now we're not quite at the point, that point yet. But then she, she opened up, she'd been reading in um, Luke's gospel and she's pointing to passage where Jesus was saying uh, basically telling us to expect persecution Mm -hmm. and she was like I don't want to sort of exaggerate here but I feel like this is what I'm you know I feel like what Jesus is talking about here is also what I am experiencing at school and you know in another form and I was like yeah you're you're not wrong um this is this is what discipleship looks like it's hard it's painful and you are doing it so well because you're showing I mean she's loving she is absolutely loving um, her friends, all her friends are non-Christians, um, and she's also standing for Jesus boldly. And I think, sadly, too often uh, our kids are not, we're, we're not necessarily even discipling our kids to do that. We're, we're either saying, um, withdraw from the world, maybe hurl the odd um, grenade across the, the parapet as well, but don't, you know, don't go and be actual kind of, meaningful friends with with people with people who might have you know, fundamental disagreements on the one hand or we're basically um giving our kids permission to just entirely integrate themselves to the point where they have no distinctive witness whatsoever and and standing for jesus isn't hard because they're not standing for jesus right. so it, it's that cross the, the the crossfire of that um and one of the things I, i've said to her and to to my other daughter who's 10 is this doesn't actually get easier as you get older. Um, it's something I still experience in in, in different ways and, and relationships of of you know losing relationships with people because of fundamental disagreements um, and where we may be positioned as on the side of evil because we're Christians. Yeah, and it's just interesting to think about the generation of Christians the Lord can be raising up by having these younger generations uh, deal with some of these tougher questions um, at you know younger ages. Um, 
And, and I've got to say too, my internet has been going in and out. So I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've not been in this interview as much. So I hope it doesn't mess up on, on y'all's end. Um, but Rebecca, I remember the last time that you came on the, the podcast, which just to our listeners, that was episode 323. You can go back and check that out. But we spent a good deal of time talking about singleness. And I know that this is a topic that you're, you're passionate about. And as we all know, Jesus w- was single. Um, and just curious, once again, as you studied him more deeply and as you immersed yourself into the Gospels, how has this how has your thoughts on, on singleness been nuanced, deepened? Um, just, just share with us a little bit about that. I think we have a huge idolatry problem in the church when it comes to marriage. Marriage is a really good thing. And in biblical terms, it's a thing that points us to Jesus's love for us. You know, it's that, it's that good mm-hmm. that it's, it's designed as a picture of, of Christ's love for his church, um, husband's love for his, his wife. And that's actually why that, like that gospel message is at the heart of Christian sexual ethics. And I, I'm at the point of saying any conversation that's about Christian sexual ethics that doesn't actually focus on Jesus of the gospel isn't a conversation about Christian sexual ethics. Um, we, we've got to anchor everything that we're saying is, is flowing out of that picture of Jesus and, and, his, and his church. But if that is true, then that also means that marriage is not the ultimate thing. Mm-hmm. It's a signpost to the ultimate thing. Right. And the, the verse that's currently haunting me in the, in the best possible way and on which I'm basing the current book that I'm writing, which is about friendship, is when Jesus on the night that he's betrayed says to his disciples, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. In many of our churches, we would have ended that sentence differently. We would have said, greater love has no one than this, than a love of a husband for his wife. Or, greater love has no one than this, than a love of a mother for her children. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, greater love has no one than this, than that he laid down his life for his friends. He, Jesus never commanded us to get married. He never commanded us to have children. He did command us to friendship in that verse very specifically. And part of one of the consequences of our idolatry of marriage, as if that is the kind of climax of human experience and the, the, the destination for young people in particular, you know, we'll raise a good Christian boy or girl and their their goal in life is to get married to a good Christian girl or boy and have good Christian children. You know, these are all very good things. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Like I'm married to a, a wonderful Christian man and, and praise God um, seemingly so far, at least our, our, our children are believers. My four-year-old, it sort of depends on the day how he's sounding, but the 12 and 10 year old very much believes in Jesus and marriage is a, is a great blessing to us. But Jesus models, he's, he's both the, the ideal husband and the ideal single person. And, and Paul very clearly articulates that, um, well, marriage is, is fa- fabulous and pointing to Jesus' love for his church. Paul says singleness is even better. We've completely lost sight of that in, in our contemporary evangelical culture to where we, we position singleness as a sort of unfortunate burden to bear that hopefully will be temporary. Mm-hmm. We, we talk as if it, it's, a, it's a great um, tragedy or a mistake or, or sort of loss for someone to live their whole life as a single person. And we've designed church community around the nuclear family in such a way that single people feel very much on the fringes and left out. Mm-hmm. This is absolutely not what the New Testament is calling us to. Singleness should be something that is experienced within the family of the church. And that shouldn't just be language that we, um, you know, throw around to make ourselves feel a bit warm and fuzzy on a Sunday. It should actually be real in our lived experience. Um, when, when Jesus was um, interrupted in his teaching one day because his, his mother and his, his brothers had come to see him. He got the message, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he said, who are my mother and my brothers? And then pointing to his disciples said, these are my mother and brother and sisters. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. We think that Christianity is all about sort of promoting, um, quote, family values understood to be, it's about the husband and wife and their 
2.4 or, or 6.8 children and the kind of white picket fence. And, and that's mm-hmm. what we Christians are about defending. Actually, if we look at the New Testament, yes, we see this, this beautiful high view of, of marriage and exclusive faithfulness within marriage. But we don't see, we, we see that the primary family unit is not the nuclear family, it's the church. And, and when you get that um, that picture in place, suddenly singleness is a very different thing. It's not about somebody kind of um, hanging out on the edges, hoping that one day they'll get married and kind of be able to move into the center of community. It, it's them already being part of the family. And um, you know, Paul's uh, part of Paul's reason for saying that singleness is even better than marriage is because of the, the missional opportunities that single people have. Not that married people don't have missional opportunities, but that there is you know, a, a freedom experience in singleness that I, as a married person with children, don't have. And I feel I actually feel that limitation on a very daily basis. Not that it's a bad thing, but it is a limitation. And there's also a, a particular way in which single people are pointing to the sufficiency of Christ. Because ultimately, anyone who, who remains single is not losing out. They are they're, they're not waiting for a human, a sort of merely human spouse. They're, they're waiting for the Lord. And there's, there's no more powerful way in our culture today to, to point to the goodness of Jesus' love than to wait for the Lord in, in that particular way. Um, so I think the more that I understand of who Jesus is, the more convinced I am that singleness is equally good, if not better, as a, as a state in which Christians should live as marriage. But, and this is also true of marriage, but I think it's, um, you know, I'm going to apply it to singleness in particular for a minute. Being on mission for, like being single and not being on mission for Jesus is is not a fun place to be. <laughs> um, actually being married and not being on mission for Jesus is ultimately unfulfilling as well. But the 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 joy of, of Christian discipleship, single or married, but let's talk for a minute about single, is to be on mission for Jesus. And that's also the place where we will experience the most intimacy with other believers. It, it, on mission together. So. I, I would just encourage single people who are, who are listening to this and, and, and serving um, the, the younger people of, of their church that this is, they're not serving other people's kids. These kids are their kids. You know, the, in, in New Testament terms, the, the children of your local church are your children. And you are in a position to model to them what it looks like to be a faithful single Christian Mm-hmm. serving the Lord all, all of their hearts and I love I'm going to stop talking soon because I know I'm like just <laughs> top 50 minutes I set you up for it it's good one of the things I love about our community group that meets in our house on Tuesday evenings is that it is largely single people and so my children get to be in close relationship with single adults who are serving the Lord as um, doctors or financial consultants or whatever they are um, and and they get they get to to see what it looks like to serve Jesus as a single person in ways that I can't model to them. Mm-hmm. And my married friends with kids that, you know, that their, their friends, parents also can't model to them, but they, they get to see that in our Christian community. That's so beautiful, Rebecca. And what a blessing that is to my soul. I had just recently, I got married four months ago and up until then, like, yes, I was single in ministry in my thirties. And it was, I mean, and, and I got multiple times I got the comment, you know, much to uh, the, their, their shame. I got the comment of like, well, you don't fully understand because you're not married or you can't minister. You can't, you know, you can't display this to my student because you're not married. And and it was, I mean, it was so heartbreaking for me because also to experience like, well, what are you going to do when your daughter's 30 and single and she thinks, well, I'm not married. So that's what I should be doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> but and also right now that student isn't married. So it seems very right? bizarre. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So praise the Lamb. I married the best man I know four months ago and uh, we um, have a four-year-old daughter. He's a widower. And so I have a four-year-old daughter and sometimes she'll say to me, mommy, what if I don't get married? I'm like, that's great. Like you can have a great life if you don't get married. It's totally fine. As long as you serve the Lord. And she'll be like, well, maybe I'll marry Liam, her seven-year-old brother. I'm like, no, you can't. can't That's a whole other thing. But yeah. just, yeah, that delight. Um, I was reading in Mere Sexuality. I can't remember who wrote that, but um, a few years ago, mm. and doing, um, my church asked me to lead a seminar on singleness and sexuality. And, mm. um, and uh, in that book, there was uh, um, a pastor who uh, 
identifies as homosexual, but was leading a celibate life. And he was saying that his prayer and his like heart dream is that the church would love all single people so well that we wouldn't feel that void or that, that, you know, like longing for romantic relationship because the other relationships in our lives are so full and fulfilling because mm-hmm. of the body of Christ. Um, that's his, that's his dream and longing. And I thought that was so beautiful. If, yes. If we loved one another well, um, or more deeply, like what would that look like for our single people in ministry? Like would that longing be gone or whatever that was, but. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think it's even necessarily that our longings will be gone. Um, I, for those who don't know my history, I've, I've always been attracted to women um, rather than men. I'm, I'm in the, the largest um, sort of demographic of same-sex attracted people, which is women who are, are attracted to other women but not exclusively to where they couldn't be attracted to a a man and you know authentically kind of married to a man it's about I mean demographically it's about 14 percent 14 percent of women who are attracted to other women but only about one percent who are exclusively same-sex attracted and what I would say like you know I've been married for 15 years um very happily so um it's not the case that I never feel a longing for a particular kind of relationship with another woman that I, as a Christian, can't have. But when I do feel that, it's something that points me to the new creation and to Jesus, when all of our unfulfilled longings of whatever kind will ultimately be fulfilled and satisfied in him. Um, and and there's an extent to which, and, and I, I want to be careful how I say this, because I don't think any any sort of um sexual desire that we feel towards someone we're, we're not married to is essentially sinful right like it's not that this is a I, i'm not for a minute wanting to say like that's a it's a good thing um i think almost everyone whether they're married or single will at times feel attracted to somebody they're not married to so i think we're kind of all in the same boat in in one sense um certainly certainly some more acutely than others but like all kind of fundamentally in the same boat and for all of us our our, um sexual romantic desire towards folks we're not married to is is pointing us towards sin but if we can recognize that um we're not actually meant to feel totally fulfilled here and now because the the wedding of the lamb has not yet come um that can kind of free us from being feeling owned by those desires and instead push us toward trusting jesus with them and in, in, in the context of them so i mean one thing i'm fond of saying is like marriage is meant to point us to christ but it's actually also meant to disappoint us because even the best human romance could never it's only ever going to be a tiny echo of Jesus' love for us. Mm -hmm. And when we act like marriage is the ultimate thing, we actually, it's, it's very bad for married people because it makes them feel like wrongly disappointed in their marriage because they were sold, uh, you know, this is the ultimate human fulfillment and, you know, the state of Nirvana um, and it, and it won't be. And so, so married people feel disappointed and single people feel shut out. But if we all recognize that no, actually marriage at its very best is only pointing us to Jesus' love for us and singleness at its best points to, to the sufficiency of Jesus' love for us, then we'll all be waiting for the, the wedding of the lamb rather than just sort of waiting for our own sexual romantic fulfillment here and now. It's beautiful. Yeah, that, that's so good. And there, there's so much more. <laughs> I'd love to talk about that. Um, it's been hard. I've been going in and out in this conversation just because of all sorts of technical issues. So I'm hoping everything gets pieced together. But regardless of that, we really appreciate your time. I know you've got another meeting scheduled and you've got a lot going on, but just want to remind people about your your book, Confronting Jesus. Uh, be sure to, to pick that up. It's through Crossway Books and everyone can get it through Amazon as well. But Rebecca, appreciate your time and thank you for all you're doing for the kingdom. Thanks guys. Great to be with you. Oh, come and buy without money. Oh, come and feast without pay.
good.